Hello, my name is Daniel Fisher, a Rich Nation Manager at Avatable, and this is Developing Carbon Stories, a podcast about the project developers creating the most innovative and impactful carbon projects in the world. Developing Carbon Stories is a podcast by Avatable, an intelligence and procurement platform for the voluntary carbon market. In each episode, we speak with an entrepreneur from a different part of the carbon ecosystem and talk about their journey so far and how they are contributing to the fight against climate change. In series three of the podcast, we're taking a focused look at the importance of nature-based solutions and their special ability to combat climate change while providing a host of additional co-benefits. In this episode, we speak with Dr. Tim Coles, OBE, founder of Operation Wallacea and CEO of Replanet, an organization that funds ecosystem restoration and protection using both carbon and biodiversity credits in terrestrial and marine environments. Tim also helped coordinate the development of the Wallacea Trust Biodiversity Credit Methodology and encouraged the formation of the Biodiversity Futures Initiative. In the episode, we discuss Tim's views on the emerging biodiversity markets and how carbon and biodiversity markets can work together to enable the conservation of biodiverse ecosystems. We also touch on Tim's motivations for working in the space and how to go about quantifying the biodiversity impacts of projects. We take a deeper look into the basket of metrics approach to monitoring biodiversity that is pivotal to the new Plan Vivo biodiversity standard, known as PV Nature, which officially launched this week. We hope you enjoy the discussion. Hi, hi Tim, Dr. Tim Coles. Thank you, thank you so much for for joining us. Uh, on, on the podcast. Um, I'm very excited to uh, have, a, have a chat with you today, learning more about uh, yourself, your career, um, but also the evolution of the biodiversity credit market and um, and how that's looking. So yeah, I'm very excited to learn from you. Um, I'm sure everyone listening will be as well. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, of course. No, I mean, first of all, really, yeah, please, I'd, I'd love a, I know who you are. <laughs> I've read a lot about you. I've been following your work for some time now. Um, but yeah, please, I'd love an introduction. Uh, who, who are you? Uh, what What do you do? Where have you come from? Um, just to give some background. Okay, okay. Well, I'm, I'm Tim Pelt. I'm currently CEO of Replanet, which is an organisation that's uh, restoring ecosystems using carbon and biodiversity credits to stack together. Uh, throughout my career, though, I've, I've been a field biologist, and I think that's actually one of the advantages we accidentally had, <laughs> in, in that uh, I worked for a long while for the what was the forerunner of the Environment Agency, uh, and then established an organisation called the IEMA Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment, which is a um, an NGO, which is a um, the largest environmental membership, professional environmental membership in in Europe, and then left to uh, work with Operation Wallace Europe, which is um, an organization that funds long-term biodiversity research around the world and published 650 papers and about 72 species new to science, including four birds, four lizards, three snakes, etc. even a new genus of tree. And since then, since the pandemic, uh, which is when the switch happened because you try running expeditions in the in the pandemic, it's, it's impossible. So, so that's when we started um, pivoting and uh, looking at other ways in which we could use the, the scientific uh, team that we had available to us. Amazing. So then, I guess, what kind of really first got you into, I guess, originally being a field biologist, and then, I guess, from then, I, I assume the, the you know, catalyzed so much more. But what, yeah, what got you first interested in that? Well, it, well, it was more of a disinterest in being in a laboratory. That was the problem. So when I was at university, I would pick any module that required you to go into the field because it was just more fun. And also, I'm a very keen birder, so that, that helped make me want to go outside. Mm. Brilliant. Love that. <laughs> Serendipitous then. Um, so then, obviously, yeah, got that and then uh, Replanet, which is uh, so far pretty, pretty successful and amazing work being done. And so... Yeah, maybe you could go into a little bit about how Replanet itself works to protect uh, the environment and, and increase biodiversity. I mean, um, we will I, at some point. I think we'll be touching on sort of the voluntary carbon market and the biodiversity credit market. But um, yeah, in, in your words, how is Replanet really captivating this? Well, what we're trying to do is to demonstrate that the private sector investment via carbon and biodiversity credits can make a real difference to to wildlife conservation. 
about 70% of the world's economy is private sector. So surely 70% of the solution to the problem we're having with, with species loss and, as well as climate change uh, should be uh, something that the private sector will certainly be interested in potentially helping. So that's what we're trying to do is to set up some examples of projects uh, that can be replicated uh, very quickly and that can make a real difference. So we have five main areas of, of work. The first is in mangrove restoration, but, but everybody's trying to do mangrove restoration, Daniel, all around the world. And it, it's, it's, um, it's very difficult because most of those mangroves are controlled or owned by governments. And therefore, they were constantly delayed waiting for government approvals or going through carbon laws or the, there's always some excuse, Daniel, about why it's not actually happening. And so we have a whole mm. series of, of mangrove projects in Mexico, Costa Rica and Indonesia, which does appear, which do appear, we have government support for and which we're now beginning to push through. But that's been a long run to get to that stage of getting the, uh, the support in position. So in the meantime, the second market we concentrated on was, was basically native forest restoration. Now the problem with native forest restoration, of course, is it's expensive. All of your costs are up front in the first few years. Uh, and you don't start getting any decent number of carbon credits until quite a long way down the, around down the road. So your cost of finance is massive. And so what we did was we hit upon a, a method of using accelerated species. And this meant that we could bring down the cost of the carbon credits produced by this type of approach to around about $11, which is now pretty competitive in that marketplace. This is for native forestry. We're not talking about restoring agro schemes or forestry schemes. This is purely mm -hmm. native forest restoration. And the way, the reason that it works is because we're not just looking at carbon, we're looking at carbon and biodiversity. And incidentally, the combined price of those two credits is $11. So you can either have it of all carbon with biodiversity co benefits, or you can have it with carbon and separate biodiversity credits. But essentially, what you're trying to do is to maximize biodiversity as well as maximize carbon and that changes the whole sort of uh, dynamic of it we've got a whole series of projects uh, uh, nine projects between costa rica and, and uh, panama in in that uh, area and those are being funded or we're going through various stages of due, due, due diligence with different funds and and different corporates and the third market is the marine side of things because when you move beyond mangroves, you're basically talking about marine reserves that have got no carbon in them at all, or very little that it's worth messing about with. Mm. And so the only uplift you've got there is biodiversity. But sadly, some of these marine reserves that everybody's drawing lines on maps at the moment around the world to show that they're going to meet their 30% protection of marine sites by 2030, sadly, many of those areas have been quite badly damaged, quite overfished. And simply closing it off to fishing, even compensating the fishermen, but closing it off to fishing can allow those areas to recover very rapidly. And because they're such large areas, you're talking about generation of basically millions of credits of biodiversity credits. And that has the huge advantage that the cost of those credits can be really low. It can be as low as one or two dollars, mm. because that's enough then to fund the protection of that site um, uh, in, in the long term. So we've got a project in Anguilla that we're working on at the moment. Hopefully that will come to market very soon. And then the fourth type of project we work on are avoided loss. Now, I'm always nervous about avoided loss projects because of the problems that have been in the red plus uh, world. But it does yeah. seem a little crazy sometimes that you're fixing areas whilst at the same time, very, very good areas are being destroyed. I mean, very good areas in mm. terms of biodiversity, not in terms of carbon. Uh, so we have a site, for example, in Honduras, which was funded by GlaxoSmithKline. And what we've been doing is quantifying the biodiversity credits that would be issued if that could be funded entirely from the private sector. We've got another project in Transylvania, protecting meadows, oh, beautiful meadows. You know, if, if people, the only thing they learn from this podcast is go to Transylvania. That is a fantastic <laughs> idea. It's such a beautiful part of the world. And those fantastic meadows and wildlife are currently being ploughed up, as we speak, by large agro companies. And here we've got an opportunity to, to help fund 
the existing farmers to continue those practices and maintain the beautiful, um, uh, beautiful biodiversity. And we've got other sort of high profile projects like, for example, um, there's a uh, uh, Floriana Island in the Galapagos has been, a lot of money has been spent on removing the invasive species, you know, the rats and mice and cats and goats and pigs and so forth. And they're now reintroducing uh, 15 species that used to occur there, but were then right. limited to just tiny islands. So they're basically returning a Galapagos Island to its former um, sort of zoological condition. And that one's been funded entirely by biodiversity credits. There's no carbon in that. Uh, and we have a, a Scottish island, the largest uninhabited island in, in the UK, that's being rewilded again. Yeah. You know, th those are exciting stories, and I think those on their own sell on the sort of biodiversity end of things. And then the fifth thing we do is it always occurs to me, you know, that the, the, the biggest impact on biodiversity is agriculture, simply because of the footprint. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the big agro-food companies are looking at spending money on helping to improve carbon storage and, and biodiversity on those sites. And they're measuring the carbon storage bit, they're not measuring the biodiversity bit. Why not quantify that properly and express it in terms of units of biodiversity gain? So you can say, look, farm A has got a 20% increase in biodiversity across a thousand hectares. Because that, of course, gives it a lot more credibility than just saying we spent money on increasing biodiversity or just using a, a single metric. So those are the five main areas that we're working in. Oh, fascinating. I think, um, I think the problem is I could talk for about sort of six or seven hours uh, and I'm picking that and, and, and picking your brain on it, but uh, don't worry, I, I won't. Um, what I will pick up from what you just said is, of course, um, you know, there are lots of blockages in um, in accelerating this this market, especially sort of the biodiversity side. Um, and I'm actually sort of uh, using some of what I've heard from what you say. Um, and, you know, price is one of them. Um, now, you've actually spoken about how you can somewhat overcome this, you know, with scale um, and accelerator species. Um, the other one is, of course, the quantification of these biodiversity credits, which you've touched on a little bit here. Um, but I feel like um, this is an amazing opportunity uh, for me and for everyone to learn a bit more about this quantification of biodiversity credits, um, given the complexity of it, um, and given that actually it's the question mark on everybody's um, on everybody's uh, sort of thoughts at the moment uh, in the market. So if you can go into a little bit more on that and what Replanet um, and Operation Wallace here have, have put together. Okay, so. Let's describe it first. So the, the, the reason, remember, we started this was because we couldn't take anyone on expedition. So we had all these scientists sitting around. And so we ended up doing a very, very large consultation exercise with lots of organizations around the world to try and define what a unit of biodiversity change was. Everybody knows what it is for carbon. It's a ton of carbon dioxide equivalent. But what is it for biodiversity? Because that's the key bit to get right. Because once you've got that, then you, then you can develop a whole series of methodologies to, to uh, for use data from that format. And so we were stuck to begin with until we thought about the, the consumer price index, which is a basket of goods and services that every country prices up. And we compare inflation rates around the world, but every country uses a completely different basket of goods and services. And so they should, because that's what they're buying and you're trying to quantify what they're buying. So why don't you use the same approach for conservation? Why don't you have a basket of metrics that reflect what you're trying to achieve for a particular habitat? So if you're working, for example, on a coral reef in Indonesia that's been bomb fished and cyanide fished, and you are uh, trying to close that reef and protect it long term, you sent a, a marine biologist to look at it, and then she came back two or three years later and said, wow, that's a lot better. What's the basis on which she'd be making that judgment? And it would be things like rugosity, how many nooks and crannies and holes there are in the reef, coral cover, species richness and biomass of herbivorous fish, same for piscivorous fish, uh, species richness and biomass of commercially exploited invertebrates. And that would give you a good indication if all of those had improved, you'd said, look, that reef's getting a lot better. But none of those metrics apply to a lowland farm in, in, in Holland, where you're trying to rewild it. Um, you, you're not trying to improve coral cover on a lowland farm in, in Holland. What you're trying to do is to improve soil biodiversity um, total you know, higher plant species, richness and, and abundance, um, mm. pollinators, um, butterflies, breeding birds, etc. 
And so what you do is you choose a basket of metrics that reflects what you're trying to achieve for a particular set of habitats. And then those metrics just replace the word now metric with taxa, which is a group of species, either functional taxa like soil invertebrates or feeding birds or uh, zoological taxa like butterflies. And then what you do is you, you measure each of those at time one and again two or three years later, see what the change is. So you've now got your list of, let's say, breeding birds. Now, not all birds have the same value. Some are more important than others because their red list species declined massively or they're, they're already, they've already started off rare. Um, and so you grade each species into a five point scale. And that's based on conservation value. So it, it, critically endangered or a red list species would be a five a least concern of a green species would be a one. But when you go back again in two or three years time, you're not just looking for a change in, in species richness. I mean, great if we've got a couple more species, but what you're more interested in is an increase in abundance. Because the, the when we hear that 70% of the world's biodiversity has been lost, we're actually talking about a change in populations, not species. So we're looking at the abundance is pretty relevant. And so you allocate a relative abundance for, for each species. And if you've got time, I'll explain how that works. Um, and that's again on a five point scale. And you multiply your relative abundance by your conservation value for each species, add it up for all the breeding birds, and that gives you a number for breeding birds that you've got. Again, you do it again two or three years later, you've got a higher number. Well, I hope you've got a higher number because you've done it, you've managed it properly. Now that's a percentage difference from the baseline. But you've got a different percentage difference for your soil invertebrates, <laughs> for your, your <laughs> pollinators, for your butterflies, for your, you know, uh, higher plants, etc. So what you do is you take the median value of those changes, multiply it by the number of hectares, and that gives you the number of units of biodiversity gain that you've got. Okay, so that's how you you measure an uplift project. If you're going to measure an avoided loss project, what you're looking for is the difference between your site. And what it will become. Now, let's say in, in the in the classic example of the one we've just done in Honduras, where we've got a cloud forest, and it's going to become a cardamom field or a coffee plantation. <laughs> it's fairly easy to to tell the difference. Mm -hmm. So you take you measure the biodiversity in cardamom and coffee plantations and compare it to the metrics in a cloud forest and the amount of the percentage uplift between them, which in this case is about four hundred percent, multiplied by the number of um, a hectares will give you the number of units of gain that you are protecting over, let's say, a 25 year period. So you would then, after three years, go back and measure it. And as long as your site, your original site, your cloud forest is as good or better than it was, you get three 25ths, because it's three years in, of a 25 year project of the total number of, of, of units of gain. Okay? So you mm. can do it either as an uplift or an avoided loss. Now, the problem with it, is who's going to believe you know <laughs> if you do it Daniel, and you come up with a you know someone's decided to cheat the system and they said okay look, let's use mm. fruit flies and something that grows you know reproduces really quickly <laughs> we can get a massive increase you need an independent way of, of stopping that happening and that's been created mm. now it's called the biodiversity futures initiative and it's an independent group of academics uh, based out of nottingham university but it's it's um They've got a 14 strong sort of editorial panel of scientists from all across oh. Europe. Yeah. Uh, and they're creating a, um, an, a, a specialist panel of leading experts in different tax and different ecoregions. Mm. It, they're aiming for 100. They've got around about 50, but it's very Eurocentric at the moment. So we're trying to, or they are trying to get more applicants from Africa and North America and South America and, and Asia, etc. cetera. Uh, but the idea of that organization is it's, Anyone can send a claim to for you. So you've done your mm. measurements and you say, look, we've got a 30% increase in, in this thousand hectare site. And what they're going to do is they're going to examine all the data you've collected. So you send in all the data, a lot of it's digital, of course, and then you're comparing that against mm -hmm. your field notes. So they'll do some samples of that. They'll check the identifications, etc. cetera. Uh, they'll redo the calculations. And at the end of it, they'll say one of three things. Yes, you've got a 30% increase. No, you haven't. We think it's closer to 15%. Okay. Or worst, go away. We can't do it because your sampling is so appalling. So in, in order to avoid okay. that happening, 
they introduce a thing called the stage one review, which is where you as a project developer can go to them and say, um, okay, this is our site. These are the metrics we think are appropriate. This, these are the methodologies we're going to use. And these are, this is the sampling strategy. And the idea behind that okay. is that they then approve that before you start on your expensive MRV monitoring and produce a lot of data that they can't actually utilize. You're guaranteed that they won't throw it out because you've done it wrongly or chosen the wrong metrics at that point. You're not guaranteed mm. you'll get your uplift, but they're guaranteed that you, you can't have it rejected. Now, we use that in every case now, because why wouldn't we? Because it costs £2,000, you get an answer in three weeks. You know, why wouldn't you use it before you spend a lot more money? Mm -hmm. um, and the advantage also of the of the, uh, the the stage two, where they do where they verify claims, is that's done in six weeks and it's five thousand pounds. I mean, that's massively cheaper and faster than, than mm -hmm. and in my view, much more academically rigorous than you're getting from carbon certification bodies. So that's one of the blockages yeah. that's been removed. And incidentally, one of the things you can do with it is it allows you to sell your carbon in two ways. So you can now sell it as carbon with verified quantified co-benefits and that increases the price of the carbon but what we're increasingly finding is some of the funds come into us and say look we yeah that's fine but we really like credits as well and so what you can do is you can you can then go to the next stage beyond the the, the biodiversity futures initiative so in which case you go to a registry that can be a digital registry or it can be a traditional one like market and they issue the credits and retire the credits now the advantage mm -hmm. of that is it removes the problem you've got in the carbon world where the carbon certification bodies the larger the claim they verify the more credits they issue the more money they get paid so there's a conflict of interest that doesn't happen under yeah. this system the, the biodiversity futures initiative will never issue credits will only verify claims and it's done by a, a third party that does issues the credits Now, you've, you've touched on it a few times, and um, obviously there are synergies, right, between the, the voluntary carbon market and, and the biodiversity credit market. And actually, you, you've, you've kind of answered my question before me, uh, before I even asked it of what these synergies are. But I actually think um, one of the main questions that I'm not hearing being asked enough of people who have been entrenched in both and actually are experts in both uh, what can the biodiversity credit market learn from the voluntary carbon market now that we have the benefit of, you know, 10 to 20 years of, mm. of seeing how this has run through? You know, what are the key, what are the key things that we can learn? What are the key mistakes that have been made that, you know, we can now make sure we're putting in place? Okay, so, so there's, there's some good things and bad things. One of the good things market was at least they started with a unit of change. So lots of methodologies developed, but they all produced their results in terms of tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Mm -hmm. That hasn't happened in the biodiversity world. There are 23 different schemes operating at the moment. And they all produce the results, or most of them produce the results in a completely different format. So the sort of methodology I described to you is very different from a methodology that measures one species and, and assesses its success by a reduction in threat. It's a very different output. You can't compare the two between them. So the first thing that's needed in the biodiversity market is, is to follow the lessons of that market. Start with a unit of change. Now, fortunately, most of the major sort of de developers are all coalescing around the following definition. A biodiversity unit of gain is a 1% um, gain per hectare in the median value of a basket of metrics that reflect the conservation objectives of the site. And they all agree also it should be a, a minimum permanence of 20 years. So that works for the Wallacea method, it works for Plan Vivo, Vera, for Terrasos. So we've got, I mean, that, that hides a lot of differences underneath how that's produced, but nonetheless, they are all coalescing around a definition like that. And I think that's a crucial element we've got to get agreement on. Otherwise, you will mm. that will slow investment in, into. The second thing uh, that um, we've got to learn is to include additionality at all times for biodiversity credits. Mm. You've seen the mess in the carbon markets. 
And that's all about basically arguments over additionality for avoided loss projects. Now, why would you try and start a biodiversity credit market without additionality? And that's, that's exactly what a few people are trying to do. Now, the argument for that is that, well, what happens if you've got sites uh, which have already been well protected, so there's no threat to them, and you are, um, you know, they're not going to get any money at all under that system? Well, firstly, I'd always challenge the argument. I was sitting at a meeting the other day and someone suggested Indonesia has lots of forests and reeds that are fantastically well looked after. Well, that must have been to a different part of Indonesia to me because, because you know, Indonesia is a classic example of where there is, you can easily show uh, mm -hmm. additionality from the threat. But there may well be places around the world where there aren't those levels of threats. But why would you undermine the entire biodiversity credit market by accepting that? Have it as a separate class of credits. And, and, and Burr has done that. They've come up with a thing called a nature stewardship credit, which is where you can, you can, you can it's, a, it's a credit that you get for investing in a project that's already properly funded and would have produced the same biodiversity whether you'd spent that money or not. Uh, I can't see it being a big seller, but I, I could be wrong. But at least it removes it entirely from the biodiversity credit world. And then the third thing is uh, making sure the local um, stakeholders, owners, users, managers of the site are getting a fair crack of the whip. And when we started out in this carbon world, I had telephone calls with people who said, look, don't worry about the local communities, give them 15%, they'll be very happy. You know, that's not the way we should be operating. We should be operating where the local communities get a 60% benefit, local stakeholders, mm -hmm. owners, users, managers. Mm -hmm. Of course, in developing countries, not primarily communities, but in, in, of course, in Western countries, it's sometimes you know farmers, etc. They get that, but they should get the vast majority of the of the income from it, and not just get it at the point of your baseline budget. But if we produce credits under the market price, and we do, so our mangrove credits, you know, we're aiming for fifteen dollars. Yeah. Our, our uh, reforestation, we're aiming at eleven dollars. You could double those prices almost today by selling those same credits. Hmm. So if the community have got 60% for that um, at the baseline, they've only got 30% on the resale. So we have a clause in our contracts that any increase of the baseline budget, 60% of that goes paid back to the community. Now that means two things. It means that whoever buys those credits can't be exposed in the Guardian or somewhere else as exploiting the local community. Mm -hmm. You bought a $30 credit, but only one dollar of that's gone to the communities. And that's an important thing, because that is the next big scandal that's on its way. Mm. The second thing is the investor gets the credits at basically 40% below market rate. Because the other 40% they retain for investing early in the project. So it's a win-win for both sides. And then the final bit that's, that we need to improve is the certification process. And I, I just described that to you before, because that's mm. a massive hold up. I mean, an almost total block at the moment for, for biodiversity, but for, for carbon, it's like a two-year wait. And so mm. you've got to find ways around that. And I do think academic peer review, which is used to support the entire scientific publication industry, um, you know, it should be used outside that industry and used directly for, for things like verifying um, biodiversity claims. So those are the four main things we've got to get right. Some of those are learned from we can improve upon in the carbon markets and in particular making sure that the verification of a claim is independent mm -hmm. from the, the number of credits issued yeah fantastic yeah absolutely yeah. and um again you've yeah. you've done very well in answering a question that i hadn't quite asked but um i'm glad you have you know and that was going to be you know there has been so much criticism as of late um with this around the voluntary car market especially red plus projects and you know how do you how do you make sure that you avoid that similar criticism well additionality from the start local stakeholders getting a, a fair amount uh, like you say 60 percent and this obviously um, make sure there's clear justice f climate justice for all from the get-go um yep. the certification process and yeah couldn't agree more you know that academic peer review not only does it make sense but actually it brings a huge amount of credibility um, from the get-go that it's um it's the right people, you know, uh, approving this um, from 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 the start, and so I think that's incredibly personal. I think, um, yeah, really interesting, and and I hope that that's really taken on board uh, for those creating creating the um, 
the market. And I guess that kind of takes me now maybe looking forward a little bit um, into the next sort of 12 months, 12 to 18 months. You know, obviously we have COP just around the corner now um, that hopefully biodiversity plays a, plays a huge role in that agenda. So in your opinion, I guess a couple of questions. What does, that, what does this market need? to to really sort of uh, catalyze its growth um, from the sort of maybe the demand you've, you've mentioned what it needs from a sort of scientific and um, quantification perspective but from the other side you now the demand side the investment tapping into that private capital that you know as you've mentioned this private sector they are spending that money already on on carbon so you know tapping into that um, makes a lot of sense so how how can that happen? What does it need? And then I guess my final question is, what do you want to see uh, from COP? Or what do you think needs to come out of COP to help catalyze this market, but also just to help foster a more conducive environment to create these projects and to encourage more project developers creating these projects? Okay, so the, the first question is, the first answer to that is quite simple. We need trades. We need, we need to see these things actually yeah. happening rather than talking about them. Um, where I see those trades happening is, is primarily in the carbon market, because everybody needs carbon, um, but quite a few people want biodiversity. So if you can have a project that is a carbon-based project, but which is also producing biodiversity uplift and changing the way you do the project, so you're maximizing biodiversity as well as maximizing carbon, that's where I think I see them happening. So that's why the riparian restoration projects, they have a huge impact on biodiversity and they have a big mm. impact on carbon as well. Uh, and yet the combined price is $11. So however you split it, that's a good deal. Um, and if, if I was a buyer, I'd think, you know, why wouldn't I get some biodiversity credits out of that? I'd, I'd, I'd get the carbon credits at, let's say, um, you know, $9 instead of $11, and I'd get the biodiversity credits at, let's say, $5. Remember, it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. It's not just a matter of adding the two numbers together to work out what the relative ratios are. Um, and I think that's where it's going to start because everyone, we've got 23 projects, all about a billion credits plus from carbon or biodiversity and or biodiversity. Um, and that's how mm -hmm. I think it's going to start. That's where we're seeing the massive interest at the beginning. Same with mangroves. Um, less important the biodiversity there, but it's still nonetheless an element that ought to be quantified and potentially. Set. So I think that's where the mass markets will, will start mass trade. Uh, but then there's also some companies decided to go nature positive. They have no idea what it is. And to be honest, nobody has any idea what it is. But what they're doing is looking around for projects that they can invest in outside their supply chain. So that it's clearly not associated with their impact. And um, so, so that we see those as sort of biodiversity led projects. They still work better if you've got some carbon. So for example, you know, the wildlife, you know, the Scottish Island one's got it's primarily wildlife, but it's got some carbon with it as well. So, so are some of the other projects that we talk about. The Transylvania project's got exactly the same. Uh, and we see that as a um, some purchasers that are particularly interested in burnishing their uh, biodiversity credential, getting something under their belt, as it were, are looking for projects like that, led by biodiversity, but it's got some carbon. Um, and then you've got the sort of the really exciting project, you know, your mangrove, it's your Floriana Galapagos type project, you know, mm. we're talking about what about uh, about a, uh, a potential uh, site in, in Wales as the first substantial black grouse upland breeding site to be created. I mean, those are such spectacular stories that you know, <laughs> I can see one or two organisations being interested in, in those. So yeah. that, that's where I see that the market happening in its trades. And we need lots of trades for this to happen yeah. um, and for it to be seen. And I think once it gets going, what you're going to find is it, the secondary market is much bigger for biodiversity credits than it is for carbon. Because nobody mm. looks at other carbon dioxide. Right? Just, they're just not lovable. <laughs> but yep. you know, the entire conservation bodies support, support uh, themselves on voluntary donations for people wanting to help yep. wildlife. And I think once you can quantify mm. the benefits that you're getting for that, I think that'll be the, the game changer. And the, and your secondary market will be will be huge. Yeah, 
couldn't agree more. It's it's so sensible, right? Like it makes so much sense uh, when you say it out loud. And then just to touch on that last point, yeah, what what do you think? Um, what do you think needs to come out of COP if you uh, if you if you uh, have thought about that? Um, that kind of will help catalyze this. Uh, the best thing COP can do is 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 push forward on that on that reporting requirement. Um, I, I'm, mm. I'm not a huge fan of governments directing people to do things, but having having um, a requirement that you have to report on your biodiversity impacts are in the same way as you're reporting on your climate impacts. What that does mm. makes a huge difference. We saw it in, in Montreal when the people signed up to it in theory. Let's see actually now working in practice. Because um, once yeah. companies have to report, they have to measure. Once they measure, they realise, crikey, mm. you know, I've got a few problems here. I'm going to have to do something about it. And then that's what starts that. That's what will kickstart that whole business. And what it will do, I hope, is push people. We're already the carbon industry spending 850 billion already on carbon. Most of that's private sector spent. Mm. If we can convert a lot of that into ecosystem restoration or protection. You get carbon and biodiversity, and so that would be the mm. sort of the final push, I think, to to convert a lot of the investment into in carbon into doing something that's good for for both carbon and both and for the wider environment. Mm. Makes a lot of sense. And um, with that reporting, um, does come somewhat uh, a level of being held accountable as well uh, for, for once you've reported it. You know, what you're going to, you know, public the court of public opinion will kick in, and you know what you're going to do about it. So um, I hope, I hope, yeah, I hope that does come through from it. Um, Tip, we have a couple more minutes, and so we've done. Um, We've done uh, four of these podcasts within this series, and you know we we go into the the projects in quite a lot of detail, and then we um you know, we do talk a bit about the you know the, the good, bad, and the ugly of what's going on at the moment. But I always like to finish by asking, you know, the climate crisis does kind of feel like whenever you put on your know, news, you see something. Um, but you know, obviously, it's not all negative. It's not all doom and gloom. And so, what well, I'd like to hear, you know, what gives you kind of the hope in this fight against climate change? I, I, I think the sheer number of people I meet on a daily basis that are really putting a lot of effort into trying to yeah. to invest in 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 climate change. And I, I, I probably don't get a random selection. I get a lot of people also interested in biodiversity as well. And I think that's hugely encouraging. Mm. As I said at the start, 70% of the world's economy is private sector. If you don't get them involved, yeah. we're never going to solve either of these problems. It, most of that funding is going to have to come from, from the private sector. Um, Tim, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. But uh, beyond that, thank you so much for all the work you've been doing uh, over, over the years, really pioneering um, you know, ecology, biology, and, and biodiversity credits. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's inspiring to speak to you. And uh, I'm excited to see where this, this whole market can grow. And um, yeah, thank you so much. OK, thank you then. Thanks, Mike. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. If you're interested in learning more about how you can support these projects, get in touch with us at hello at abatable.com or visit our website where you can also explore our market intelligence products to help users better understand the carbon markets. See you next time.